You're listening to In the Balance, an Iowa Judicial Branch podcast. Welcome back. In this month's episode, we are sitting down with Court of Appeals Judge Michael Mullins out of Washington, Iowa, to learn about his non-traditional path to the bench, the effect his background in social work had on his approach to his legal practice, and the case that left a lasting impact on him over the course of his career. Keep listening. Thank you for taking the time. Uh, to take a call from your home base in Washington, Iowa this morning, Judge Mullins, for this interview. As a fellow Washington, Iowa native, I'm very excited to get to sit down and talk one-on-one this morning. Can you start by telling us a bit about your path to the Iowa Court of Appeals? Well, yes, I, I guess I would start with, um, you know, upon graduation from uh, law school, I had made a decision really a lifestyle decision that uh, I wanted to move my family to Washington, Iowa. Uh, We had had a son while uh, in law school, and uh, I was uh, kind of a late bloomer going to law school, so I was 30 years old by the time I passed the bar and uh, decided to move to Washington and joined a a four-member law firm that was a, a true general practice law firm. At that time, they were still following kind of the uh, what I would consider to be the old business model of uh, every lawyer in a general practice, small town law firm needed to uh, do everything, every kind of uh, of, uh, of law. And so, uh, so that's the environment in which I started. I worked there for about five and a half years and was reaching a point in my career where I felt the need to begin to uh, limit my practice some so that I could really work on skill development in more specific areas. Uh, But again, that law firm's focus was a general practice lawyer does everything. I uh, began looking around and um, I changed law firms uh, in Washington and joined a firm where I could focus more of my practice on litigation and um, uh, and started to develop uh, that uh, part of my practice uh, more uh, specifically, uh, as well as branch standard to a few other areas, doing some bankruptcy, uh, I've worked for the local uh, uh, county hospital and some uh, other significant clients. And so I practiced uh, law there for another uh, 14 uh, years. And so after uh, about 19 years of uh, private practice, I had uh, begun to apply for uh, district court uh, positions, district court judge positions. And uh, I was appointed to the district court uh, by uh, Governor uh, Tom Vilsack in uh, late 2001, actually started uh, as a judge in early 2002, and then um, I was appointed to the Iowa Court of Appeals by Governor Branstead in uh, uh, 2011. And you mentioned that you got your law degree a little later in life, and a part of that is because you also hold a social work degree. So can you tell us a little bit about what motivated you to move from social work to law and how that background in social work translates into your law practice? Yes. Well, actually, uh, the um, my path um, took... Uh, uh, perhaps a, a non-traditional uh, approach in many ways. Um, when I was a freshman in college, my uh, dad passed away uh, suddenly of a heart attack at age 38. And and uh, I kind of, uh, the best way I can describe it is I went off the deep end. I began to make uh, a lot of poor decisions uh, with regard to uh, my life, my future, in particular, uh, my studies. Uh, so by the time I graduated from college, I had a really lousy grade point average. Even though I graduated in three and a half years, once I decided to really buckle down, I uh, managed to graduate uh, uh, in three and a half years. But about the last year of college, I I kind of really turned things around, decided I needed to make some better choices and, and uh, began to get really good grades. But by that time, it was too late to translate very effectively to uh, an overall uh, grade point average that would help getting to law school. So I decided I wanted to go to law school, uh, but uh, 
quite frankly, was unable to uh, get admitted into any law school. Upon graduation from college, um, a woman that I was dating at the time who decided that uh, whoever would, uh, each of us would go back to our hometown and whoever got a job first, the other would move there. My um, girlfriend, uh, wife-to-be, was from Burlington, Iowa, so she got her job first in Burlington. I ended up moving to Burlington um, and took a job working in a boy's group home for uh, teenage boys who were in trouble with the law or uh, just couldn't live with their families any longer, that sort of thing. My girlfriend and I soon after got married and have been married for 47 years, so that's just a little aside. <laughs> but in any event, um, so I was working in the group homes, uh, but by that time, how I had ended college, uh, I really was hungry to learn and uh, I wanted to advance my education. And uh, so I ended up pursuing a master's degree in social work from the University of Iowa, where uh, I did very well and got my master's degree uh, there. And after uh, working in the group home business for about five years, I uh, decided that uh, I would retake the uh, law school admissions test, the LSAT, try to improve my score. And uh, by that time, I had a master's degree that I hoped uh, admissions uh, personnel at law schools might be interested in. I uh, applied and ended up uh, being admitted uh, at uh, Drake Law School in what was then a, a conditional program that allowed uh, people to uh, to come in and, and into a summer program and uh, prove they could uh, be a successful student or not. And I excelled at that and, uh, of course, proceeded with my uh, Drake Law School education. So, yeah, my mind was not a decision to pursue social work and then a decision to go to law school. It was really a decision to go to law school. When the barriers were there, I chose another path and then and then rerouted once again uh, uh, back into law school and, uh, and got my law degree. And like you said, you had wanted to go to law school right out of uh, getting your bachelor's degree. When you had your sights set on the law, did you also have your sights set on becoming a judge and joining the judicial system in that sense? Or did that goal emerge as you um, entered into your career? That really, that really emerged later. I think I was pretty focused on, shall we say, immediate uh, goals at that time. As I mentioned before, my, my practice was uh, focused pretty heavily on litigation, so um, I was uh, in the courtroom quite a bit. I was uh, uh, interacting with uh, district court judges uh, a lot. And uh, at some point, a chief judge of our district uh, actually had a conversation with me, asked if I had considered uh, being a judge. Um, he thought that, uh, or at least he told me, that he, he thought I had what it took uh, in terms of, of ability and, and uh, demeanor and um, and, and skills and so forth, and uh, he encouraged me to uh, consider a path that would uh, take me toward uh, becoming a judge. So I really took uh, several years to kind of think about that and decided I really did want to go that way. I did want to pursue becoming a judge, um, but I also wanted to wait until I felt the timing was right, both in terms of my family situation and just in terms of my own uh, professional development and uh, and professional progress. So, uh, but then there came a time in the uh, in the late '90s when I felt like the time was right for me, and some vacancies uh, came up in our district. Uh, that's when I then found an opportunity to apply and, and get appointed to the court. When you were first appointed to the district court bench, like you said, in 2002, one of your first projects and probably your longest lasting as it's still in effect today is the criminal statute summary chart. So what spurred you to create that document and how has it evolved in almost the 20 years since it was created? Uh, that, that's a, a story that's, uh, that's almost, uh, I don't know, almost a reflection, I guess, of my career. The summary chart uh, happened as a result of my own uh, need for such a tool, um, uh, almost an act of desperation, if you will. <laughs> I was appointed. I was appointed to the district court, and uh, uh, my, as I have indicated, my practice was primarily litigation. But in the last 
oh, about 12 years or so of my private practice uh, litigation, I had moved away from any significant uh, criminal law practice. In that time, the Iowa legislature had uh, adopted uh, a sig- significant number of changes in uh, Iowa criminal statutes that affected uh, sentencing provisions uh, for criminal defendants, especially in the areas of drug, uh, sex offenses, and uh, and a number of other offenses, and, uh, and had also adopted a number of different surcharges, uh, criminal penalty surcharge, uh, we had the law enforcement initiative uh, surcharge. We had drug uh, enforcement, uh, that is a DARE surcharge. Um, later on, then other surcharges came in. And anyway, so when I started as a district court judge, after about three weeks, I realized that I needed to get a better handle on, on some of the various enhancements and additional penalties that uh, were applied to various uh, criminal offenses. Those are scattered, by the way, all throughout the uh, criminal code provisions. In other words, you can't just simply go to a a provision and and see all of the penalties that apply, say, to even a a burglary. You have to look at a number of different code sections that will apply to burglary versus some other offense. I looked around, tried to find some resource that would be helpful, and I did not find one. And so I actually sat down at my kitchen counter one afternoon and uh, sat down with the code books and started going through them and um, began to develop a uh, an Excel spreadsheet. That was actually in late January of 2002. And uh, I kept working on it and developing it. And uh, by, by sometime in October of that year, I had a, a document that was a fairly effective working document uh, for me. I found it to be a useful tool. Mm-hmm. And um, in the process, I had at some point shared with uh, then Justice Michael Streit um, a copy of the uh, of this Excel, Excel spreadsheet, which was about 15 or 16 pages long at the time. Um, I shared with him to see if, uh, if I was permitted as a district court judge to copyright it. Uh, then a couple months later, being still a, a fairly new judge, uh, uh, around a year uh, of seniority, I guess, um, I attended a new judge orientation uh, class at, uh, uh, at the judicial building, and Justice Strite was a uh, main part of the faculty of that. And I showed up there, and uh, Justice, I'll never forget Justice Strite looking at me and said, Mullins, do you have a copy of that chart with you that you had me look at? I said, well, yeah, Justice, it's out in my vehicle. He says, uh, would you bring that in and share that with the other new judges? And so I did, copied it, shared it by my participation in uh, some educational seminars then and sharing it with other judges. It ended up um, kind of becoming a useful tool for all judges, uh, um, and eventually, even the Iowa Supreme Court asked uh, if uh, if I'd be willing to have it uh, published on the website. And then, uh, more recently, about uh, five years ago, as I was um, beginning to anticipate the end of my career, my uh, someday retirement. And also by that time, I had been on the Court of Appeals for about five years, and the chart was not as important to me as a daily tool, so that the annual updates that were necessary for the chart were becoming more and more difficult uh, for me to accomplish, both in terms of time and resources. I reached out to uh, Professor Bob Rigg at the Drake University Law School Legal Clinic, and uh suggested to uh, to him that it would be a great uh, educational tool for students to work on the annual uh, updates of the chart as well as a uh, continued valuable uh, resource to uh, the legal community and the judicial branch in particular. Uh, so Drake University Law School agreed to uh, take over the ownership and rights uh, to the chart. So I continue to uh, consult and meet with them regularly. Uh, they have uh, two uh, students, uh, legal research students who work on the chart 
and uh, keep it updated every year and have completely redesigned and redeveloped the chart so that it is now a document that's over 500 pages long and has mm. over 5,000 footnotes and uh, is uh, substantially relied upon by, by judges and lawyers throughout the state. Wow, that's impressive. So due to your past experiences, which we've talked about range from social work to general practice to the district court, how do those experiences inform your work now that you're on the Court of Appeals for the past 10 or so years, and how does that help you go about deciding cases? One of the things that I, I realized early on, even as a uh, in my practice of law, was that the social work background really helped me focus the the work I did as a lawyer, uh, especially in the areas of uh, criminal law when I was representing some criminal defendants, more specifically probably in the area of uh, dissolution of marriage or, or other types of litigation or consultation that involve uh, personal relationships or uh, legal issues arising out of personal relationships. And what the social work background, I think, allowed me to do or helped me do was was separate and clarify my role as a lawyer and kept me from doing something that I have seen throughout my career a number of, of, of lawyers do and that is struggle with the uh, with how to deal with some of the emotional and mental health issues that arise in, uh, representing clients with the legal issues involving, as I say, relationship issues or uh, like dissolution of marriage and, and so forth. So in short, I, I realized that, that I could identify when a client needed to be referred to a counselor as opposed to needing a lawyer to work through uh, some of their issues. I uh, have seen a number of times when lawyers uh, especially young lawyers sometimes have a struggle with separating their roles or their role um, as a helping person. Uh, they have a hard time separating and dissecting out, if you will, what they should be doing as a lawyer helping person as opposed to referring them on to someone else for uh, other aspects of the needs of that of that person. Does that make sense to you? Yeah, absolutely. It's a, um, yeah. finding a way to yeah. assist them in their legal matters while also finding them the assistance from other professionals. Yeah. 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 So then, then that, that, that really followed with me into, you know, on the district court bench and, um, you know, to also realize my role is limited to dealing with the legal issues. Yes, we have to recognize some of these other issues, emotional issues, mental health issues, need to uh, provide resources for those. But just because those people need the resources doesn't necessarily mean that the court is the best uh, environment in which to provide those resources. And similarly, even um, uh, up to the Court of Appeals, then it's, uh, I think it's just, the social work background has helped me realize where we need to draw the line sometimes between what we can do in a, as a legal profession versus what we should more effectively leave to other professionals. Right. Do you have a most memorable case that you've either tried or decided in your career? Well, yeah, I, I, I certainly have one that, um, uh, they had the most significant impact on me, I suppose, uh, around, I forget, I guess it was, it was around 2007. Um, and there was a murder in Bonaparte, Iowa, uh, in which a, a young man uh, shot and killed his uh, his father while in the middle of, a, of an argument, uh, shot and killed his mother while she was literally begging for her life. We know that because her voice could be heard in the background on a 911 uh, emergency call that was being made by this young man's sister. 
uh, who was hiding in a closet after her mother pled for her life and and then you hear, heard a pop from a gun. Then he proceeded to silence the phone by shooting the sister uh, through the phone and then he killed two more sisters. So he killed his mother, father, and all three sisters and um, uh, was caught and uh, charged, of course, with all those murders. And then uh, he waived right to a jury trial and I was specially assigned to the case. So I was both judge and jury in a case that uh, got a lot of attention uh, the first time I showed up at uh, the courthouse for a hearing on the case. There were five satellite trucks uh, sitting outside uh, the little court uh, uh, courthouse in uh, Kiyosakwa, Iowa. So that was a quite a significant uh, case, a case that I spent uh, a considerable amount of time on and a lot of, of emotional uh, energy and so forth. You know, unlike when a uh, when a jury returns a verdict, uh, you know, you, we've all seen uh, how that goes. Uh, jury comes back in and the judge has, says, have you reached a verdict? And and the clerk uh, reads off the, the guilty or not guilty uh, verdict. Well, when a judge has to decide a case instead of the jury, because the jury has been waived, the judge is actually required to write uh, a complete ruling uh, with findings of fact and so forth. And and then to announce that ruling uh, in open court. So, so that's what I had to do. And uh, uh, we had a standing room only, a courtroom, and again, significant press throughout and, uh, the whole trial, of course, but then the reading of the verdict. And uh, I've often said that that, uh, that case uh, took a, a considerable toll uh, on me during that year. You know, it's, it, it's a case that uh, tragic, uh, of course, uh, the difficulty to me was nothing like the tragedy to the family and, and the whole community. Uh, this was a community that... Um, uh, the three sisters that were killed were all high school students at the same, at that time, all in a, a very small school district. Even in the uh, more than ten years since uh, uh, since that trial, I will continue to or occasionally uh, run into uh, people who have had some connection with that family or uh, that circumstance uh, down there. It, but it certainly impacted me in my career. Uh, in, in a lot of different ways. Absolutely. And lastly, um, I always like to ask if there's one thing that you could leave our listeners with about the Iowa judicial system to take away from this episode, what would it be? If I had one message to give uh, to people about the Iowa judicial system, it would be to recognize the value that uh, from which we benefit in Iowa because we have a, a judicial selection process and retention process that is not nearly so politicized as uh, as in other places. I'm certainly not an expert on on all the various uh, state judicial systems, but I have had the opportunity over the last 20 years to travel to a number of different states and interact with a number of judges from out of state uh, from other states. And I'm quite satisfied, quite satisfied that um, our system of selection and retention is one of the best around. Uh, but with that, we have to be continually vigilant to, to protect that uh, and avoid politicization of those processes. You know, there, there's always going to be people that are, that are unhappy with specific re- results and and will attempt to characterize that decision making in the polarized political environment um, that we currently have uh, and and rarely are those difficult decisions as simple as as uh, you know favoring one political party or one political ideology or another that is just not how judicial decisions are made in Iowa. We need to be ever vigilant to protect the system we've got, enhance and improve, but avoid the politicization. That would be my final shot, I suppose. 
Well, thank you so much for your time today. All right. Thank you very much. You've been listening to In the Balance, an Iowa Judicial Branch podcast hosted and produced by me, Marissa Gall. If you would like more information about Iowa's courts, you can visit www.iowacourts.gov. You can also follow the Iowa Judicial Branch on Twitter and YouTube at Iowa Courts. This episode of In the Balance is now adjourned. Until next time.